seen. What the ITTF tests for. Hi, technical leaflet T3 doesn't prohibit bores without seam from being approved. But where there is a seam, there should only be one and it should be uniform. If there isn't a seam, artificial seams are applied to the bore for testing purposes. So the ITTF allow both seamed and seamless bores. Our observations. Unlike the prototype bore, the Dula Super P40 Plus plastic bore has a seam just like Dula's Super 40 celluloid ball. But when you look closely, the seam on this Dula plastic ball, well, it doesn't look as wide or as pronounced as it does on the celluloid ball. You can see this better when I convert this photograph I took to black and white and exaggerate the dark tones and luminance. And look how much more obvious the seam is on the celluloid ball. Part of me is wondering if this is because the plastic ball has thinner walls and is more translucent, allowing more light to pass through it, whereas the light reflects back off the denser or thicker celluloid walls. But I'm not sure. And we'll look at this in more detail when we conduct our luminance tests. Whatever the reason though, this Dula plastic ball definitely has a seam, just not as prominent as this Dula celluloid one. Surface of the ball, what the ITTF tests for. As spin plays such an important part in table tennis, and the ball is an essential component of that spin, it's surprising that the ITTF don't test for the coefficient of kinetic friction on a table tennis ball. Especially when they consider it important enough to test for it on the surface of pimpled out rubbers. Our observations. Now one of the major differences we found between the prototype ball, this ball here, and a celluloid ball was in the smoothness of this particular ball. In addition, the prototype feels a lot, lot smoother. It really does. Surprisingly so. If you look closely at it, it's hard to see any pitting of pores on the surface of the ball. And we suggested that this smoothness might be one of the reasons that the prototype ball lacks spin and speed compared to the celluloid one. So, is that significant, this smoothness? Well, as it happens, potentially yes, because here we have a golf ball. And as you can see, there are lots and lots of little dimples on it. In other words, your golf ball's not smooth. And why is that? Well, it's got something to do with different types of turbulence and golfers have found that these little dimples help the ball travel through the air quicker. And as a golfer, it also helps with the spin. Now, think about it. If we're moving from a ball which is going from a little bit of friction to one which is smooth, potential is we're also going to end up with a table tennis ball which is going to be a little bit slower, potentially a lot slower, and also not capable of the same amount of spin. But it has to be said that this Dula plastic ball, well it feels much much rougher than this prototype which I've still got. And there's a little demonstration, that's the celluloid ball. Listen to the actual rubbing of these two balls together, the prototype against the celluloid. And now I'm going to repeat it with the plastic Dula ball against the celluloid ball. Prototype, plastic ball. This Dula plastic ball is definitely rougher than that prototype. Now by setting up a little home studio with dedicated lighting, I took some macro photographs of a Dula plastic ball and a celluloid one and then study them close up. This is a macro image of one of the stars on the Dula Super P 40 plus ball. You can see that the plastic ball now has a roughed up surface and it looks like it's covered with little specks of sharp grit similar to what you'd expect to see on sandpaper or crystallised ice or snow. By comparison, this is a macro image of one of the stars on the Dula Super 40 celluloid ball. You can see how the surface looks like it's covered in something, well, a bit like fibreglass mesh. It's not as sharp, but it's more pronounced. And you can also see here some gaps in the labelling, where the ball's surface is uneven and the paint or ink hasn't been able to penetrate down into the lower part of the surface of the ball. So there's a definite difference in the texture or roughness of the surface of these balls. And it will be interesting to see if the gritty surface on this plastic ball will have an adverse effect on these expensive rubbers that we like to buy. But that's a different story. For now at least we can confirm that this Dula Super P40 Plus plastic ball has a roughed up surface. Much better than with this prototype ball that I've still got. But is it going to be enough to allow us to generate the spin that was missing? Let's find out.
spin test. To put this to the test, I tried a very basic exercise. Using my match setup, a Peter Frudlieb custom bat with Dr. Evil OX on my backhand, and a one month old sheeted Tybo 1Q XD on my forehand, I stood at the left hand edge of these Jula 3000 SC tables. And using the Tybo 1Q XD, I tried to get both the plastic and celluloid balls to bounce and then spin straight back to me, spin sideways right and off the table, and spin sideways left and off the table. Now this isn't a demonstration of serving. These balls are bouncing far too high for a decent serve and will be easily killed. But as you can see, they do demonstrate that it is possible to generate good amounts of spin with both types of ball. It's also important to remember generating spin has a lot to do with technique. And if I can generate this much spin with my limited technique, I'm pretty sure you better players out there should be able to generate even more. But does this mean that I could generate as much spin with the plastic ball as I could with the celluloid one? Well, from a personal point of view, no, not quite. It's close, but it's not quite there for me. I felt I could generate just a little more spin with the celluloid ball. And most importantly of all, I preferred the feel of the celluloid ball on my bat. Now feel is a very personal thing, but for me it's one that matters. And one of the things that affects feel is the hardness of the ball. Hardness. What the ITTF test for? Technical leaflet T3 measures hardness by using computerised wick tester or equivalent and applying pressure against various parts of the ball and measuring the degree of indentation. How are tests were done? I can't afford a Zwick tester, so I originally tried to record the sound of the balls bouncing and then using my audio software determine the pitch of each bounce. The higher the pitch, the harder the ball. Unfortunately, this didn't return usable results. So instead, I bounced the balls on a glass surface to see if it's possible to detect a difference in how they sounded. And I applied pressure to the ball with my thumbs to see how easy it was to deform each ball. Results. Sound. I'm going to play you the sound of each of these balls bouncing on the glass table, but I'm not going to show you the film. Make a note of which one you think is the plastic ball and which you think is the celluloid ball. And the only clue I'm going to give you is this footage from our video back in 2012 when we reviewed the prototype. It sounds like a broken egg. Yeah, it sounds broken. It sounds, it sounds broken. Here's the first ball. And here's the second ball. And now for the answers. The first ball was the celluloid ball and the second one was the plastic ball. To my ears at least, they sound very similar. And much, much better than the broken sound of the prototype. Thumb pressure. Here I'm applying pressure to various parts of each ball with my thumbs. What I found was that the plastic ball was harder to push in and when I did get it to go in, it didn't reform as often or as easily as the celluloid ball. The plastic ball definitely felt harder and thinner to me, and more rigid. The celluloid ball on the other hand felt softer and more malleable, and it was better at reforming after I made indentations onto its surface. Interestingly, if you can ignore the TV in the background, sorry about that, listen to the different pitch the balls have when they spring back after being pushed in. The plastic ball typically has a higher click or pitch to it, and that's a sign that it's a harder feel to the ball. The celluloid ball, well that's more of a dull thud. And talking of compression, here are those same two balls two months after that footage you've just seen, and I was not expecting to see this. The celluloid ball has almost completely returned back to its original shape. There's just a couple of indentations left here and here. The plastic ball on the other hand still has more of the indentations I made. This difference was even more obvious just a couple of days after filming. I'm wondering if the comparative inability of the plastic ball to absorb a blow and reform to its original shape is one of the reasons that we've been hearing about plastic balls breaking. In boxing terms, it lacks the ability to absorb a punch. And whilst we've been hearing talk in the short term of increasing the durability of the plastic ball by potentially increasing the thickness of the walls of them, perhaps manufacturers would be better advised to consider the elasticity of the ball, making it better at reforming, absorb the blow and then reform. That certainly would improve its ability to last longer. But I'll leave that particular idea up to the scientists out there. 
Conclusions. Okay, we've shown you that the dual plastic ball has a seam, albeit narrower than its celluloid sibling, has a surface which is much rougher than the prototype ball, which gives us hopes of decent spin and speed capabilities when compared to dual celluloid ball, that its walls appear either thinner or more translucent. It sounds similar to dual celluloid ball, but it feels harder to the touch and less elastic than that ball. Thank you for watching.